welcome back to the second lecture of this course. In our first lecture, we discussed two important terms magnification and resolution. Resolution is one of the important criteria to know the performance or power of a microscope. So, we have come to a formula that is Abe formula, which is nothing but resolution or d minimum is equal to 0 0.61 lambda divided by numerical aperture. And as we have discussed, the lambda or wavelength of the light or any particles has to be as small as possible to get the best resolution or the smallest d minimum value. Otherwise, we can increase the angle of aperture that is alpha or refractive index. But that was due to diffraction. We have also, as we discussed in electron microscope and other microscope also, we, we use several lenses and those lenses also give some aberration and that would deteriorate the resolution of a microscope. Today, we will discuss about some of those aberrations. And in addition to discussing the lens aberration, we will also talk about the history on electron microscope, light versus electron and what is a scanning electron microscope. Let us go to lens aberration. We have three major aberrations, one is spherical aberration, one is chromatic aberration and another is diffraction aberration. We have couple of more aberrations too. Let us first discuss spherical aberration. This is also called monochromatic aberration or achromatic aberration. The other names are monochromatic aberration or achromatic aberration. So, this aberration, spherical aberration is caused by the difference in convergent position of the rays or light passing near the opti optical axis and away from the optical axis. As you see, the rays passing close to the optical axis have a different focal point as compared to the rays passing away from the opti optical axis. In practical case or we will desire to have a focal point where all the rays will cross, but practically it does not happen. That is why it is called spherical aberration. It is due to that rays passing close to the center of optical axis and the rays passing away from the optical axis have different conversion, convergent position. And this is uh, denoted as DS, spherical aberration, which is nothing but 2 CS alpha Q, where DS is the spherical aberration and CS is the spherical aberration coefficient, spherical aberration coefficient and alpha is the angle of aperture or aperture angle. Now, if alpha is more, then there will be more spherical aberration. In the resolution formula, if, if you have seen, you have seen if alpha is more, then we will have a better resolution, the smaller d minimum value. But here spherical aberration uh, is going to be more if you are increasing the alpha or angle uh, aperture angle to maximum. And thus this CS value uh, is uh, around, uh, this is around, it is called gamma 0, V 0 divided by N i square, where this gamma 0 is a constant that is between 100 to 150, 100 is for uh, strong lens and 150 for weak lens and V0 is the potential, N is the number of coil and I is the current. This is what the spherical aberration. Then uh, next is our 
chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration and chromatic aberration is caused by the variation of energy of the light or electron incident on the lens. As you see uh, of different colors are given, the blue color have a smaller focal point, small f value compared to the red color. So, the electron beam or light passing through the lens have different energy and therefore, they have different focal point and this aberration is called chromatic aberration. Here chromatic aberration uh, C C this chromatic aberration we can write chromatic aberration uh, D C is equal to C C del E by E alpha. Here is the energy difference del E divided by E alpha, alpha is angle of aperture. Again here it is chromatic aberration coefficient. coefficient and alpha is the angle of aperture. Uh, angle of aperture and this C C is nothing but gamma 0 prime f objective and this gamma 0 prime is again a constant uh, its value goes from 0 0.5 to 1 and here uh, we can also show let us say this is a lens and we have here uh, blue blue focus focal point we can have a red focus here. So, now if you see here this part, this part is called, this part is called uh, Dix of least confusion, Dix of least confusion. So, here instead of getting a spot, we are getting a Dix. If we put a screen, if we put a screen at blue focus here, let us say it is blue focus, then we will see a blue dot and red halo. If we put a screen at here, then we will see a red dot and a blue halo. Actually, we wanted, we want to have a smallest Dix or smallest light spot, rather we get a Dix, and this is called Dix of least confusion. We would like to have as small as possible. This is here the chromatic variation. Then we will go to uh, diffraction variation. So, as you see here, uh, light passing through the lens or aperture we undergoes diffraction and this diffraction is our we have discussed about this 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 is dc diffraction aberration it will be equal to uh, dd is equal to 1.22 lambda by alpha here everything you know here dd is the diffra diffraction aberration and this everything you know lambda and alpha so, what we have seen here previously spherical aberration was directly proportional to the alpha q that is higher the angle of aperture higher will be spherical aberration. Similarly, higher the angle of aperture higher will be the chromatic aberration. On the other hand higher the angle of aperture smaller, smaller will be the diffraction aberration. So, these are contradictory to each other. We shall see later how you need an optimum 
angle of aperture to get the best resolution. Certainly, we need to have an optimum angle of aperture to get the best resolution. Whether these three are the aberration? No, we have some more aberration too. Let us discuss those, what are the other aberration. Astigmatism. Astigmatism is an another aberration. Uh, it is an optical distortion due to which sharp images are not formed. It arises when the rays traveling in different planes have a different fo focal point. So, for example, the rays traveling in the x direction, uh, uh, rays falling in the x direction of the lens and the rays falling incinerating in the y direction of the lens have different focal point. Then this astigmatism comes and it is more serious when the lens properties is not uniform across its area, then the astigmatism comes due to which we do not get the uh, properly focused image, rather we get distorted image. We have other distortion such as barrel distortion. Barrel distortion is the distortion uh, when the magnification is reduced when we go away from the optical axis. As you go from away from the optical axis, you see the magnification is decreasing, that is what the barrel distortion. Another distortion is called pin cushion distortion. Here, magnification increases as you go away from the optical axis, this is what pin cushion distortion. So, these are some of the aberration uh, due to which we may not get sharp and good uh, image in our microscope. So, now uh, we will discuss little about uh, the early history of electron microscope after covering some of the basic uh, uh, terminology in, in the microscope because uh, we are um, one of the major part of our course is scanning electron microscope. So, that is uh, let us see what the history of the microscope. In 1931, German physicist Ruska and Knoll constructed the first transmission electron microscope. Uh, if we look at the utilization of the microscope, electron microscope, then certainly we will see there are at least 100 times more scanning electron microscope utilized all over the world as compared to the transmission electron microscope. And scanning electron microscope are much cheaper than transmission electron microscope. But first discovery happened on transmission electron microscope. So, in 1935, uh, Knoll built the first scanning microscope with resolution about 100 micrometer. Then uh, Manfred Ardin uh, pioneered the scanning electron microscope by adding scanning coils to the transmission electron microscope, which is nothing but a scanning transmission electron microscope. Then Roska and Bodo in 1938 improved the resolution of the TEM to 10 nanometer. And in 1938, first practical electron microscope was constructed at the University of Toronto by Eli Franklin Button and his students. And then 1939 Siemens produced the first commercial TEM. The first true SEM scanning electron microscope was developed by Vladimir Jorskin who saw the topographic contrast using secondary electrons. You will see later how the secondary electrons are utilized to get the uh, topographic con uh, contrast. Today also we use same secondary electrons to get the uh, best contrast using scaling electron microscope. In 1952, Charles, Charles Ottley and his student Mark Mullen achieved a resolution around 50 nanometer using the SCM built by them. Then in 1960, Everhart and Thunley improved the secondary electron detection capacity. And in 1963, Peace and Nixon combined the previous improvements in one SEM with three magnetic lens and a Everard Thunley detector. In 1965, the first commercial SEM was built by Cambridge Scientific Instruments and named Mark I Stereoscan. So, you see the first commercial scanning electron microscope came in 1965. So, it is almost uh, like uh, 60, 70 years now and we have uh, at least 100,000 
scanning electron microscope available worldwide. It is more than 100,000 uh, scanning electron microscope available today to investigate the material properties. So, after this brief history, uh, let us talk why we use electron and what is the advantage of electrons as compared to the light. Certainly, light also have certain advantages and indeed electron have also advantage. Let us discuss what is the difference between them. First is the wavelength. There is several thousand difference between their wavelength. Uh, wavelength of light is around uh, 400 to 700 nanometer light. But for electron, it can be 0 0.001 to 0 0.01 nanometer. This is electron. As you see, a large difference in the wavelength, and therefore, our resolution will be much higher with electrons. Then, scattering. Electrons scattered much uh, strongly by the gases as compared to the light. Actually, electron will not pass a few millimeter in the air at atmospheric pressure. So, if it cannot pass few millimeter, how it will come and strike the specimen and gives a signal. So, the electron path has to be evacuated to use electron beam in the microscope. So, scattering is much more for electrons as compared to the light with electron and thus we need high vacuum in the electron microscope. This is about the scattering. So, then charge certainly electron carry charge and therefore, it is opens up the possibility of using electromagnetic lens. So, electromagnetic lens in optical uh, microscope we use glass lens and making a perfect glass lens is not that easy. On the other hand, we can use electromagnetic lens for which we need nothing just electromagnetic coils and light can pass, the electron can pass through the electromagnetic lens uh, therefore, giving us uh, much more possibility to get the precise alpha value angle of aperture as compared to the uh, glass lens used in the optical microscope. Moreover, as it has charged, uh, these electrons can be scanned back and forth, which we cannot do with light. That is why coming the scanning electron microscope, uh, we can use electron beam to scan back and forth and study the surface of the specimen. This is what about the importance of the charge in the electron microscope. Then we have type of the lenses. Certainly, in the uh, opti optical microscope, we use the glass lens. On the other hand, in electron microscope, we use electromagnetic lens. So, it has the advantage that we can have a precise angle of aperture alpha value, uh, which can be very narrow and uh, much more precise. This is what about the advantage of the electrons as compared to the light. But uh, electron microscope uh, cost is also much higher. More, moreover, it needs large space, certainly one room to occupy and its maintenance is also expensive as compared to the light microscope. Light microscope can be placed on the tabletop. So, electron microscope can be placed on the tabletop, but still it needs control environment. Certainly. Uh, larger area and maintenance is high. And also the specimen prepar preparation also uh, is required for studying the elect 
uh, studying under the electron microscope uh, as compared to the light microscope where we do not need uh, much sample preparation. So, as we were talking about uh, the wavelength of the electrons in an electron microscope that I was telling 0 0.001 to 0 0.01 nanometer. Uh, so, uh, electrons carry charge, it is a negatively charged uh, 1.6 10 to the minus 19 coulomb and then it has a rest mass of 9.1 10 to the minus 31 kilogram. So, if the electrons is accelerated through a large potential difference, then its velocity can very well uh, approach the speed of light. Whence, when any particle or object uh, goes with a velocity close to the light, then its mass will increase, the relativistic mass. So, the mass will no more be same as that of rest mass. So, therefore, as the velocity of the electrons is approaching the velocity of the or speed of the light, uh, the mass has to change, as mass has to change, its velocity again will change, therefore, the wavelength will change. So, for the calculation of its lambda value or wavelength value, we need to take into relativistic mass of the electron. As we know relativistic mass of the electron mr is, is equal to m0 divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square. This is what relativistic formula. Uh, v is the velocity of the particles, let us say electron and c is the speed of the light in vacuum. So, as the electrons have a wave nature, we can as per the de Broglie relation lambda is, is equal to h by as such all particle that we see around or all the objects uh, have all um, wave and particle nature, wave particle duality. And, and, and if we apply a potential difference in the electron microscope, uh, so we impact momentum to the electrons and that is giving kinetic energy to the electrons. Uh, and thus we can write that uh, potential difference E v is equal to half m v square, here m is let us say m 0 rest mass. So, then v is equal to root over of 2 E v divided by m 0. Then we can write uh, let us say m 0 v is equal to m 0 root over of 2 E v divided by m 0 which is nothing but root over of 2 m 0 E v. So, the energy given to the electrons is nothing but change in its mass. So, so we can write uh, the energy given to the electron is nothing but nothing but the change of mass mass of the electrons. So, we can write E v E v is equal to m r relativistic mass which is higher mass increases as it travels with a speed of light which will be c square or we can write uh, m r minus m 0 is equal to E v by c square or m r is equal to m 0 plus E v by c square. So, then we know uh, this formula lambda is equal to h by m v. So, now lambda is equal to h by m r v here relativistic mass we will use which is equal to uh, 1 upon uh, root over of 2 m star 2 m r e v here m v 0 this is what we got it here uh, which is equal to h by root over of uh, 2 m r is equal to uh, we can write this is equal to m 0 plus e v by c square into e v. So, which is equal to nothing but if we, we if we put the value of h Planck constant uh, charge m 0 c all if we put then we will get it is at around 
1.5 root over of 1.5 v cross 10 to the power minus 6 v this is potential difference and this is nanometer uh, this is what the lambda value this is the correct corrected lambda value taking into relative the relativistic mass uh, taking relativistic mass into account so uh, for example if we give a potential difference uh, let's say we give a potential difference uh, 20 kb 20 kb potential difference then we can have uh, um, wavelength lambda uh, uh, uncorrected we will come at around uh, 0. Point 0.0086 nanometer. Uh, if we have let around say let us say uh, 200 kb, then it is uncorrected will come at uh, 0 0.0027, but corrected with this formula it will come at 0 0.025 25 nanometer. This is a nanometer, this is corrected relativistic corrected wavelength corrected lambda. So, as you see our wavelength is coming as 0 0.0025 nanometer that is very small wavelength and that that small wavelength is can gives us very high resolution. So, this is what the wavelength of the light in the electron microscope. So, now what is an SEM? So, uh, the uh, SEM is an instrument that scans the sample surface with a finely convergent electron beam under vacuum. So, that electron beams has a wavelength much smaller that we have seen and that detects the information or signal produced at that time from the sample and presents an enlarged image of the sample surface on the monitor screen. So, so SCM first word we told scanning it scans the electron beam second word electrons electron beam scans the, elect uh, in the electron beam which scan over the surface of the sample and M is microscope SCM scanning electron microscope. So, now here electron beam act as a prop like our finger can act as a prop similarly electron beam can act as a prop. So, at electron beam will scan over the surface and produce the image and that image is produced from the signal obtained from the sample surface. This is what I see and in next class next lecture we will discuss more about this scanning electron microscope and its capabilities. Thank you.